invite you to stand as you're able for our call to worship. <clears throat> Come and see what God has done. God is awesome. God turned the sea into dry land. Make a joyful noise to God, all the earth. learn from God's wisdom as we confess our faith together. The Old Testament reading is Jeremiah chapter 29, beginning with the first verse. These are the words of the letter which Jeremiah the prophet sent from, sent from Jerusalem to the elders and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into, into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. It said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles in Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters, multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your own welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you and do not listen to the dreams which they dream. For it is a lie which they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, says the Lord, for thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know I have plans for you, says the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart, I will be found 
by you, says the Lord, for I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all nations and all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord. I will bring you back to the place from which I have sent you into exile. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So almost any polling of people's favorite Bible verses will uh, wind up including Jeremiah 29, 11, which you just heard, one of the verses people love. For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. And we hear that, we do different things with it. I mean, I'm fond of what uh, Anne Lamott once said, which is, um, you know, if you uh, want God to laugh, tell God your plans. That's always a good line. But what usually happens, though, when we hear this, that God has plans for us, is we, we do this kind of skewed reading of it. I, I remember this um, years ago, Lisa went to uh, one of these events. It was like a community thing for people from different churches, women from different churches. And uh, so Lisa went, and she was reporting it to me later. I said, how was the speaker? And she said, mm, okay. Uh, the speaker seemed to take as her sort of theme uh, Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life, which is a very fine book that has a lot of good things in it, except at the beginning of that book, what Rick Warren does is he does this plan for your life thing. And what he says is, the life you have is the life that God has arranged for you. The person you're married to, that's who God has arranged for you. The house where you live, that's where God intended you to live. <laughs> And Lisa said that as this was being said, she was looking toward the speaker and just, you know, in eye shot was a woman who, as Lisa put it, she was wearing a fabulous dress and had these amazing shoes and she had this oversized diamond in a platinum setting. And, and as the speaker was saying, this is the life that God has planned for you, the woman was nodding enthusiastically. <laughs> and it's easy, I guess, for somebody like that to say, yes, this is the life that God has planned for me. But Try to tell that to people that I know who, gosh, I know people who've had uh, children to die. Uh, I heard about a guy this week, I've known all his life, 32 years old, diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. You hear about somebody whose spouse cheated on them. You go to Haiti, you go to Haiti right now, right? And they, once, in, once in my lifetime, we've had a hurricane here in Charlotte, Haiti gets every hurricane. Hey, but God planned it for you. I mean, that's not how that works at all, is it? It kind of leaves God as the kind of God who would bestow favor on some people and harm other people. We think about God having a plan, we should think instead about, let's say that moment that you just graduated from college and you take that mortarboard off your head and you fling it in the air. I mean, at that point, you have got plans. You have no idea what's going to happen. You have plans, right? You're going to have a great life, and you're going to keep your good friends, and it's just going to be terrific. Or I think about on March the 1st, 1986, Lisa and I came right up to this altar. We exchanged vows, we exchanged rings, we had a kiss, and we turned to go out. We had plans. We had no idea what we were doing. But we had big plans. We're going to love each other. We're going to have a great life. We're going to stay together. Here's a better example. When parents are in that labor and delivery room and they hear their child's first cry, they have big plans for their child. But that can be a problem, right? Because what parents sometimes do is they have big plans for their child, but they overscript the child. They have, you shall do this, and you shall go to this school, and you become a dentist, like I am a dentist, as all good people are, and you will go here. And, and when children are overscripted, they, they chafe under the weight of that. God does not overscript our lives. So, God has plans like the graduate and like the couple getting married. And God, has, God has dreams for us. God has yearnings for us. And what God plans for each one of us is what God plans for every other person. That is, God wants us to know that there's a God and that that God loves us. We're, we're never alone, like ever. Like God made you. God wants you to know that and take solace in that. God, God's plan for you is stuff like John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's God's plan for every one of us is to hear that, to believe that, to look at the love of Jesus and his healing and in his touching people and in his 
crucifixion, and he taking the sins of the world on himself so that we could be forgiven, and then him rising from the grave so that we could have the hope of new life. God wants us to know that God, God's plan, God's yearning is that we will know how great God is. I <clears throat> recently finished reading a really quirky novel called The Gargoyle, and in it is this sentence that I think is well worth pondering. God is a circle whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. <laughs> Let me read that again. God is a circle whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. God wants us to know how great God is. God wants us to know that as great as God is, God has tender love and compassion for you. God is with you at every moment, even the moments that you feel like you're abandoned. God wants you to know that. God, God wants us to go, God, part of God's plan is that you go to church, and you did it today. Well done. You came to church today, and that, that honors God, just getting up and walking in this place. That's part of what God's plan for us is. Part of God's plan for us is that we will be holy. It is really hard, isn't it, to be holy in a world like this where we're just peppered constantly with unholiness. You just see it everywhere. There's just so much unholiness, but if you're tempted to be disgusted, all you have to do is just then look in the mirror, and what you realize is that unholiness isn't just out there in somebody else. There's so much unholiness in me. I need God's mercy. I need God's healing power. It's God's plan for us that we be part of a church and we help each other to cope with our own sorrows. It's God's plan for us that no matter how dark things get, we believe that God will bring us to some good end, that this life is not all there is, that there is redemption, there is eternal life. There's always hope with Jesus. God's plan <clears throat> for us. Another thing about the context of this uh, reading from Jeremiah 29, though, that's really interesting. The first thing is that in this, uh, when you read the original Hebrew, when, when God says, I have plans for you, that you is not singular you, it's plural you. They should really translate it as, like, it's like a southern God, right? God says, I got plans for y'all, right? And, and the y'all, it's, it's the people of Israel. It's the community of faith. As we read this passage today, God's got plans for y'all. God's got plans for us. God's got plans for the church. What is God's plan for the church, for us together? This letter by Jeremiah is written at a fascinating time in Israel's history. Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians have come to Jerusalem, and they have reduced the holy, beautiful city to smoking rubble. There is nothing left, and only a few people are left to live around the ruins to try to poke around and just survive. Somehow, there, most of the Israelites, the intelligentsia, the wealthy, the leaders, they've all been shipped off to live in exile far away in Babylon. And what happened to those people? You see, they got shipped away, but they thought, we're coming home soon. God's going to fix everything soon. Let's just don't even bother settling. God's going to fix everything soon. And what Jeremiah's letter to them says is settle down, build a house get married, plant crops, plant trees, you're going to be there a while. God actually says, you're going to be there 70 years. This is so interesting. Uh, when we want God to fix something, we want God to fix it pretty soon, right? Like if you pray for something today, God should fix it by the end of lunch today or at the latest by uh, sundown tomorrow. And this whole idea that God might take some time is hard for us kind of instant people. I've heard a lot, a lot of people know I'm involved with stuff in the city of Charlotte and what we're trying to do. And a lot of people ask me, what are we doing? What are we doing to fix Charlotte? And there are a lot of things we need to try to do to fix Charlotte. But let's just be very clear, it's gonna take some time. We're not gonna have some meeting and by next Tuesday, Charlotte's fine. It took us probably 70 years to get into the fix that we're in. So it's gonna take a little while to kind of work our way out. Like it takes you time to become more holy. Jeremiah says, build houses, marry wives, settle down, stay there. And then here's his big thing to y'all. He says, seek the welfare of the city where you are. To the Israelites in Babylon, he said, seek the welfare of the city where you are. This is God's word to us today. Seek the welfare of the city 
where you are. One of my doctoral students is a guy named Jason Butler, one of my students at Duke, and uh, he wrote a, he's written a book already. And he gave me a copy of the book, and I just, what he says at the beginning, I think is absolutely right. The subtitle of the book is Following Jesus into the City. He writes, it is my deep belief that God is calling the church to the broken urban centers of our nation and world. I'm writing this book to inspire you to follow Jesus into the under-resourced neighborhoods in our nation and your own backyard. To follow Jesus to do one distinct thing, and that is to love. Mars Park is a wonderful church. We love this church. We love each other. And in fact, there's so much love in this church, what God believes is entirely possible, and it's certainly God's plan for us, is that all the love that we have in here will just pour out. It'll just seep out of here, and just like floodwaters, it'll just cover this entire city. It will cover this entire city. I mean... Jonathan Sachs wrote this book about leadership that I like a lot. We, we tend to think leaders are just certain people, but he, he says everybody is a leader. He said you may lead where you work. You may lead uh, when you're out playing tennis with somebody. You may lead when you're at home. You may lead when you're out with friends. All of us lead somewhere, and the question he asks is how do you lead? He said there's always those who light a light in the darkness, and then there's always those who curse the darkness. And the question is where you are, where your sphere of influence is. Are you lighting a light in the darkness? Or are you cursing the darkness? What is God asking our church to do? To seek the welfare of the city in which we find ourselves? Think about the thing that Martin Luther King said that I think is absolutely right. Martin Luther King once said, I can never be all I can be until you are all that you can be. And we forget that, right? What we, th what we think is, well, I'll live over here in my little place, and I'll be all that I can be. I'll throw the mortarboard in the air, and I'll get married to somebody fabulous, and I'll, and I'll just I'll be all that I can be. But then there's always some nagging hollowness, isn't there? There's always something that's missing, no matter how much you are. And what it is is that God wired the world in such a way that I can never be all that I can be until you can be, until everyone gets to be all that they can be. And the joy that comes when we become a part of enabling that to happen. It's just a splendid thing. Paul in Corinthians says, if one suffers, we all suffer. This, uh, it takes time. It takes time to become holy. It takes time for us to figure out how to seek the welfare of the city in which we find ourselves. Little baby steps are required. Speaking of baby steps, I read this thing in that same novel, The Gargoyle. The, the main character, he starts the book as a very unsavory character indeed, but he's making some progress, and about two-thirds of the way through the book, he says this. While I'm not claiming I now feel great love for all people, I can state with some confidence that I hate fewer people than I used to. <laughs> this may seem like a weak claim to personal growth, but sometimes these things should be judged by distance traveled rather than current position. <laughs> So I like that. So let's say today you say, God, I want, I want, you got a plan for me. I'm ready to go with it. I'm ready to be part of your plan. So the first thing that may happen is you, you, after a while you hate fewer people than you do today. And that's a good start. And then pretty soon you like more people than you do today. And after a while you actually love more people than you do today. And then, and then you do something like it's way out for you, right? But you, you go and you pack a meal for Stop Hunger Now or something like that. Or you text in some money for Haiti and you're like, whoa, man, I'm just out on the edge here. But, th but then it gets even better because then instead of leaving food somewhere, you actually, you actually take it to somebody. You actually meet somebody that's different. You begin to know their name. And then, then, you get, then you begin to befriend someone. And, and you're not looking down on them. You're, you're, you're just friends but they're different. You didn't know them a year ago. That, that's really the key for us in Charlotte, isn't it? If we had friendships all across the city, everything would be just so very different. And then maybe one day, you, 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 you say, I'm not the likely one, but you never know where it's going to come from. <laughs> you become the heroic one who does something that's really memorable. <laughs> I think about St. Francis of Assisi, right? Now, th this guy was overscripted by his father, right? Pietro has this son, and he says, all right, you're going to be the maven of fashion, and you're going to go into the cloth business like I have, and you're going to be successful, and you're going to be one of the leaders of the city here in Assisi. And Francis was just weird, because he, like, he chafed under that, because instead he, he heard about God's plan. 
for his life. And God's plan for his life was that he would be holy. God's plan for his life was that he would seek the welfare of the city in which he found himself. So he started touching all the wrong people, and he sparked a revolution in the world where everything changed, and the church became what it was supposed to be for so long. God's plan for you to know the love of God and trust that and live into that and be forgiven by that, be transformed by it, be full of joy because of that. And then, and then you try to be holy, and you try to seek the welfare of the place where you are, wherever it is, your sphere of influence. We do it together. It's God's people, the church. That's why you're here. That's what saved people do. God has plans for y'all. Thanks be to God. Hey, thank you for watching, and uh, we hope you got something out of that. If you have any feedback for us, any response that was helpful to you, we'd, we would love to hear that. Please let us know. And everything that we put out is free, and we want it to be that way, but if you're able and feel led to, uh, to support the mission of our church or the cost of providing this online content, here's how to do so.